Hi, welcome to the first and inaugural edition of Epicenter Aftershock. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. These Aftershock podcasts are wholly sponsored, and that means that everyone you hear on these editions of the show paid to be here. But that's okay, because we have some amazing sponsors. If you're looking for the regular weekly edition of Epicenter, just look for the numbered episodes in your podcast feed. Today, our guest is Clinton Donnelly. He is a crypto tax expert. He's helped hundreds of US taxpayers, both domestic and expatriated, file their crypto tax returns. He's written five books on crypto tax, and he's the founder of Crypto Tax Audit. This guy has seen it all, and there's no tax return too complicated. If you're a US taxpayer and you hold crypto, this is a really important episode that you wanna hear. Here's what you'll learn. What are your tax obligations as a cryptocurrency holder? what you need to report and how you can prepare a bulletproof tax return, how to put yourself in the shoes of an IRS tax auditor and what to do if you get one of those scary audit letters, which I certainly wouldn't want to get. What are the biggest mistakes people make when filing their crypto tax return and the risks they face? And what to do if your crypto transaction history is totally cluttered and messy and what proactive steps you can take to help improve the situation. Finally, you'll learn about Crypto Tax Audit. It's a yearly subscription service, which is your Kevlar vest in case you get audited by the IRS. It ensures you get competent representation and advice from experts so that you only pay the taxes that you legally owe. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to learn just how little it costs to get an IRS audit insurance policy from crypto tax experts. Thank you to Crypto Tax Audit for sponsoring this episode of Epicenter Aftershock. And thanks to Clinton for offering this great advice to all of our listeners who might be concerned. And looking at our stats, I happen to know there are many of you. So with that, here is Clinton Donnelly of Crypto Tax Audit. I'm here with Clinton Donnelly. He is a crypto tax expert. He has prepared crypto tax returns for hundreds of people and helped hundreds of people understand and dissect and clarify the situation, uh, which is, you know, that everybody has to face, anybody who has crypto has to face, which is to file their tax returns. He's also the author of many books on the subject, and I'd like to thank him for being our guest today. Hey, well, a pleasure to be here. So tell us a bit about your background and how you became interested in crypto. You know, I, my background is I have an advanced law degree in the international uh, financial regulation, including taxation. And I'm an enrolled agent, which is the highest level of certification that the IRS grants, uh, authorizes me to represent taxpayers worldwide, which is what I do. I have uh, clients in 48 different countries. Uh, I got involved with crypto tax reporting uh, at the beginning of 2018, because everybody who had made a fortune uh, in 2017 started to have serious tax questions. So I became uh, a legal tax advisor to uh, a crypto tax prep firm, but quickly realized that it was a far more complicated and, and continued to build my own practice. At this point, I've written five books on crypto tax preparation. I've done, uh, I've helped I've done 900 tax amnesty returns, and I have a 100% success rate on that. And I have literally hundreds of clients, uh, you know, my biggest clients, you know, doing hundreds uh, to 200,000 transactions a year, but people having all sorts of complex situations. Nothing's too complex uh, for us in the crypto tax space. And I got a whole team. It's not just me. I got a whole team behind me that helps me do this very effectively. What's a tax amnesty return? There are times, like uh, there are certain times when you don't file a form that you need to, then uh, you're subject to penalties. Uh, there are two couple types of these. One is a, someone who like just completely, uh, and I I know a lot of crypto tax people just stopped filing tax returns. They thought you know the taxes were illegal and you know, they stopped filing. And then a couple years go by and you don't know how to get back into current. You've had a change of heart or maybe you're more concerned. You don't know how to get back. Well, tax amnesty allows us to come forward, voluntarily disclose this information to the IRS and ask for forgiveness on penalties. The other one is the anti-money laundering forms that crypto uh, trader owners have to file. Uh, if you don't file these forms on time, it's a $10,000 penalty. It's, a, the, it's not a tax, it's a penalty. So uh, and this is what Congress wanted to do to force people to remember to file these forms. So uh, when the people come to me and they haven't been filing them, there's two of them, uh, that's 20000 a year. You're looking at maybe three years worth, 60000 So we do a tax amnesty return, which means we're actually writing a legal 
affidavit that you sign under penalty of perjury. And you basically say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And uh, we attach that to the return and uh, we get people tax amnesty. So it, we have a fantastic, we have a successful method for doing that. We have a perfect track record. That's, that's, uh, it seems very daunting to someone, I think, to, to, to ask the IRS for forgiveness. Um, there's something very symbolic there, I think. That <laughs> I know, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's lots of stuff in the code uh, that the Congress put there to protect taxpayers. Uh, you know, there there's, might be reasonable cause that, that if you did, that if an auditor is auditing you, that you have a chance to appeal to his manager or go get an, an, a, go to the appeals board inside the IRS or get an, a third party inside the IRS to intervene when you're, when you're doing an audit, which are things that we do all the time for our traders who, are, who may get audited or, or non-traders getting audited as well. So you're obviously very knowledgeable about this, but tell us a bit about your credentials and the qualifications that allow you to advise and represent clients and taxpayers. Well, as an enrolled agent, I'm, uh, I've met the certifications the IRS has to uh, represent people. And because I have a law degree, I, I actually interact with the tax code and the tax regulations and do my own original thought, uh, of course, you know, doing research in the tax laws and the cases when we attack problems. Because what happened with crypto taxes is there were a lot of new terms. We didn't know how to pigeonhole crypto into the tax code or how how the tax code applied to cryptos and a lot of accountants who are skilled in you know the manipulation of numbers but not skilled in the reading of the tax law uh you know they 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 froze uh and as a result you know because i you know read the law myself i interact with the law and read the commentaries, you know, I'm able to frame, you know, we have actually a, a nine page opinion letter on the topic of like kind exchange and why, you know, we've, we've gone through the 1400 court cases and seen which ones actually apply to allow like kind exchange to work. We've, uh, we've written, written a uh, legal argument as well on this new, uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, uh, new question on schedule one. It's a top form that the new form that you report all your income on. It says, did you during the year, uh, send, sell, receive, exchange, or have any financial interest in virtual currencies, which is their word for cryptocurrencies. So every taxpayer in the U.S. has to check yes or no on that question. And you know we've written a paper because we think that's actually a bit of a violation of people's rights, uh, forcing you to you know, swear under oath certain things that are basically personal matters. Interesting. Um, so let's get into people's obligations. So what does the taxpayer need to report and how has that changed over the years? You know, the tax code just gets more and more complicated. My father used to go down to the post office, pull some forms and with a pencil or he would fill out the forms, right? You can't do that anymore. I mean, it got more and more complicated. And then people started using TurboTax, Tax Act, these other software products. And then if you got too big for them, you had to go to an accountant. So it's become more and more complicated. At this point, I'm going to, I'm going to say that TurboTax and Tax Act do not provide the type of support a crypto trader needs to report uh, fully his crypto uh, activity. I've defined, you know, when we fill a tax form, we hate, we hate filling it out, right? We just want to you know, we've waited to the last minute. We just want to get it done and mailed or, you know, get it off our plate, right? So we're, it's kind of like just get the form submitted and be done with it. Hope the number is low that you have to pay. But I've said, I basically look at a tax return in terms of how I defend somebody when they're actually getting audited. We just, our company not just does tax preparation, but once you get that letter from the IRS, you know, where they start asking questions, that's when we do a lot of work. We kick in and represent people uh, through uh, crypto tax audit. So I've, I've defined what, if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, how would I have done the tax return differently? So we have four characteristics of a good crypto tax return. I call it a bulletproof tax return. You know, trying to put a, a Kevlar jacket on your 1040. So it involves four things. First, you got to report all your income. Every transaction has to be reported. It's either capital gains, uh, mining income, staking income. You report everything. 
Secondly, you have to report, uh, every crypto owner has to file two anti-money laundering forms. One's called the FBAR, the other one's form 8938. All but the smallest crypto fi- uh, owners would have to file these. Uh, so we do that. We also do the tax amnesty if you haven't done that in past years. The third thing is to claim all losses, uh, such as if you had a Ponzi scam or a financial scam, there's a special way to report that so you can get a, a, a very powerful deduction of what you invested. Also, if you like had a lost wallet or uh, talking to one guy, he, he uh, threw away his computer and he, he lost his wallet that was on the computer and he's, you know, he's lost you know, lots of Bitcoin. How do we claim that loss? Well, there's ways to do that so that you can actually write, whether you're writing it off to take the loss to reduce your otherwise your gain. So that's the third thing. And the fourth is to... Uh, put in a disclosure statement. Now, this is really interesting. One year, I hired a former IRS auditor to work for me uh, doing uh, complex tax returns. And every time he did one, he would throw in these disclosure statements. And I said, Maurice, why why is this disclosure statement? Why do you put this in here? And he goes, ah, you got to understand the mind of an IRS auditor. They're overworked and they have quotas for how much uh, they bring in in taxes each month. And of course, the, the important thing for hitting that quota is to be able to assess penalties. Penalties are generally a percentage. The accuracy penalty uh, on unreported foreign transactions is 40%. So he said, when you put in a disclosure statement, two things happen. One, uh, it deprives the auditor of being able to claim the accuracy penalty, right? So he, he can't make as much towards his quota. And he has to prove that what you said was inadequate, he has to attack it before he can attack the return. So it's more work. It puts him on the defensive. He said, when we would get a return, it'd have disclosures in it. We would just close it up. We'd just close that return out, move on to the next one. to be easier. So that's my goal. I want, by using a bulletproof tax return, I want to take somebody from being low-hanging fruit for the IRS to squeeze, move their fruit to the top of the tree so that the IRS won't bother us too much of a hassle. That's really, really helpful. Um, and so I, I, there's one thing you mentioned there, which I think is is really accurate. And, you know, I'm not in the U.S., but it's also true here in France is that taxes are getting more and more complicated to do. Like we used to be able to do these things very easily, very simply. And now, you know, there's more pa- there's more paperwork. There are more forms. There are more intermediaries uh, required, you know, like TurboTax or this, these types of software. And so, you know, the average person uh, is is overwhelmed, I think, by by this. But there's one thing I think that kind of outlines and shows just how this complexity is obfuscated. Um, I wonder if you if you heard about this uh, this story where the the, the U.S. Government Accountability Office uh, disclosed the IRS's refusal to clarify guidance on how taxpayers should file their taxes. What does this story tell us about the IRS's policies and how should taxpayers approach this? Uh, this, is, this is an interesting drama that's going on at the federal level. You know, the IRS came out with its initial guidance in 2014. It said cryptos are property. You got to report them like property. And then people started having questions, especially after 2017. You know, well, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? IRS wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't comment. Finally, a bunch of congressmen from the Joint Committee on Taxation wrote a letter to the IRS commissioner and said, you need to address this. IRS is afraid of Congress because the IRS, because Congress has the ability to reduce the budget for the IRS. They're very afraid of Congress. Well, after this letter, the commissioner came out and said last year, he said, well, we're going to publish some guidance that will really clear up these questions. Well, people were waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, October comes in. And they finally, this guidance comes out. It comes out in the form primarily of uh, a Q&A, about 45 questions of you know, FAQ. And a lot of it's helpful. Some of it was a new area. Well, there, were, there were a couple issues that were un, people were not satisfied with how much had been done. So the Government Accounting Office, which is kind of like a, uh, an accountability watchdog inside the government, they came out with a paper that said, uh, said four things. One is these FAQs, that the IRS needs to modify them to say that this is only a comment and that the IRS is free to change their minds on this. It's not permanent. It doesn't have the weight of regulations. It's just an opinion. 
He said, the IRS can change, doesn't have to abide by the FAQ. He said, you need to come out and say that. Secondly, uh, they said, you need to speak about the form 8938, which is where you report foreign assets, one of the two money, anti-money laundering forms. You need to give guidance to crypto uh, traders on how to fill that out if it's required. And then the third thing they said, they came after FinCEN and IRS because they they're joint on this, is the FBAR form for reporting the foreign uh, exchanges. You need to provide guidance to crypto owners on how to do this. Well, before they publish the, this article or the paper, they always uh, give a chance for the agency to comment. And it came out last week. Uh, here we are. It's probably uh, like the 14th. It came out, the 14th of February in 2020. Uh, the GAO article came out. And the IRS's position was, we are not going to change the FAQ to say that it's non-binding. To make it clear, because it is clearly non-binding. They weren't going to make that clear. They were not going to make that clear. Secondly, they said, we're not going to change anything about, we're not going to comment anything about the FBAR or the 8938 form. You know, the, uh, the FinCEN group said that they would come out with some additional guidance later. So the IRS basically said, we're not going to comment. Now, there's two ways I see this. One is, hey, the FBAR is pretty in my opinion, it's very cut and dry. There's a question on Schedule B, which is the form where you list your interest in deduction, interest in dividend income. Question 7A says very clearly, I think it's clear, did you ever, yes or no, did you ever have financial interest in or signature authority over a financial account in a foreign country? So the question is, if I have an account at Hit BTC in China, is that a financial account in a foreign country, yes or no, all right? Then the second question says, if, if you answer yes, you have to file the FBAR form, yes or no, uh, are you gonna be filing it, yes or no? So it's very clear, in fact, the Supreme Court, this has been taken to court, uh, the Supreme Court said this is sufficiently instructive that all taxpayers are obliged to file the FBAR form. So maybe the IRS is sitting here saying, Hey, it's how you know we're not going to give guidance on things that are obvious. All right, that might be their position, but if it'd be kind of nice if they said that. Uh, the other position would be that they're uncomfortable saying anything because they have messed up so many times in giving guidance that if they say one thing, someone's going to slap them on the backside for not meaning addressing something else. So I think at this point in time, the commissioner has basically taken the position that we're not giving any more guidance. Uh, we know the Secretary of the Treasury said recently, uh, Stephen Munchen, that they're working on more guidance. Who knows? But I, in my opinion, I think the IRS is leaving taxpayers out in the lurch. And it tells me that they're not completely clear in their own mind what their strategy is, which puts everybody at risk. And everybody should take a very conservative posture in terms of doing your tax returns. Right, because I mean, as a as a cryptocurrency user, you might have an account, right? You said like a hit BTC or or you know maybe a Binance account or you know any any crypto uh, uh, exchange. You could also maybe have Adam staked with the staking service uh, abroad. You know, is that financial interest? Is that an account with that staking service? There, it seems to be that well, one, your know, taxpayers are not necessarily. I think informed on where these exchanges are, you know, does hit BTC have a presence in, in the U S like, I, I don't know this. I mean, I don't have a hit BTC account, but not to pick on hit BTC, but you know, <laughs> um, having to figure out where, you know, where these exchanges are, 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 are headquartered. And then all of the other sort of confusion around what constitutes a, a financial asset or financial interest, I think is, is something that a lot, a lot of people, um, you know, might, might feel, uh, unclear about. You're right on. Let's now switch over and talk about the tax return uh, a little bit more uh, specifically. You know, help our listeners put themselves in the shoes of an IRS tax auditor. What are they looking for? And, you know, if you, if you get one of these IRS audit letters, what should you do? This is an important question because we're now starting to see audit letters come out. I have one here uh, from one of my clients who's getting audited. We, he had done an amended return. Uh, we only did part of it. And the part that he did is getting audited. And we have, and this is the second one, so we actually are seeing a pattern. Uh, the exact same words are being used. So it's very informative. Uh, 
a couple things to take away from this. There were people who got letters last year in 2019 that the IRS called educational letters suggesting that they might want to tune up their tax return. Well, this guy, he never got one of those letters. He was reporting about $38,000 of income in 2017. You know, I'd call that a small amount. And he's getting audited. And you know, the audit starts, all audits start with a request for documentation. And it's very daunting. Uh, I'll, I'll read you just a little bit. Uh, you know, you and I were talking beforehand, right, about, you know, if, if you've been trading long enough, you know, you got scraps of records all over and different websites. And some people sent you emails and other people sent you, you know, SMS texts. And, you know, all you could get was screenshots of a certain like shape shift transaction. I mean, it's, it's clutter. So all of a sudden you have to prove, get this doc, you get this letter. The IRS wants you to provide copies of all emails, screen prints, hard copy prints, transaction rece- receipts maintained by the taxpayer, uh, or provided by any third party, such as a exchange, broker, peer-to-peer facilitator, wire transfers, direct deposit records, a list of all virtual currency kiosks or ATMs used and their location, uh, with copies of the acknowledgement receipts. You'll like this one. A list of all virtual currency received from hard forks, faucets, tipping, or any other method where a sale by exchange was not initiated by the receiver, commonly called airdrops, including the date, the type, the amount of the currency received, the date of sale, other dispositions, including amounts and descriptions of what was received. All right. And then, so it just, you know, this is a plus list all your blockchain addresses owned or controlled at any time by you. Uh, list of all transactions related to virtual currencies, uh, lend, virtual currency lending, including uh, collateral for loan, loan agreements, promissory notes, ledgers, transaction receipts, pledge, security collateralization agreements, all cryptocurrency exchanges. So you get the feeling this is terrifying to get this, right? If, if you've never used cryptocurrencies and you know you were presented with this, You'd never want to touch cryptocurrencies. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a, it's a great deterrent for people to use crypto and like get into DeFi and this kind of stuff. I got I got a story for you. Last week I was talking to a guy. Uh, he was in college and he had invested in faucets. Uh, must have been when he was in high school, and he'd been getting he'd he'd gotten a couple Bitcoin by now. So I'm taught he's he calls me up. He conferences in his dad. All right. So he's like, you know, we talk about it. Now, he he then invested all this cryptocurrency into a a Ponzi scheme called BitConnect and pretty much lost it all. So I said, well, you had a big run up in 17. That's actually a taxable event, you know. So I said, uh, and you don't have to pay taxes on it. And he's like, oh, man, I I shouldn't, I should just sell everything. And no, I'm not going to invest in cryptos. I don't want to pay taxes. And I said, no, 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 no. You got to understand. Taxes are good, all right? The more you pay in taxes indicates that you're making a lot more income. I would rather be somebody who, I'd rather make $100 and pay $30 of it in taxes and keep 70 than to only earn $20 and have to pay no taxes, all right? Taxes are kind of like a, a badge of the fact that I made a lot of money, you know, right? So, you know, and if you, if you kind of think about this, the wealthiest the, the people in the United States that are the wealthiest are living in the states that have the highest state tax rates, typically. Uh, same thing internationally, uh, like here in France, has one of the highest tax rates, but there's a lot of wealthy people in France. So if you conversely, if you go to the poorest countries, they have the lowest tax rates, so or lowest per- participation in the tax at all. So taxes are not bad. You don't want to pay more than you have to legally, but uh, you know, focus on making income, not trying to avoid paying taxes. The biggest tax break that all crypto traders get is what's called long-term capital gains. If you hold a coin for more than a year before you sell it, then your tax rate goes down to 15%. Otherwise, you're up at, you know, you're up in the 25, 33% range, depending on your your bracket. So this is the biggest tax break, and Congress wants Congress has given that to you. It's a long-standing tax break. It's, it's something that we should strive for to do long-term capital gains, because you work too hard for your money to just flush it down with regular tax rates. So let's go back to this audit letter and what people should expect um, once they get this audit letter. Very good. That's a great question. So 
Uh, there's a lot of, it's, it's kind of a mystery, and if you've never been through it before, uh, it's scary. Uh, and I was talking to this client here who's getting his cryptos audited. He's been audited two times before, right? So he said, I know the drill. I know what's happening. I said, you, you know the most important thing, right? He goes, yes. I know that I'm never supposed to talk to the IRS agent myself. I go, that's absolutely right. It's just like on the TV shows. You know, you never talk to the policeman when they've got you in their interrogation room. You always wait for the attorney. It's during those few minutes before your attorney shows up that they're going to squeeze you for stuff that you're going to regret later. So never talk to an IRS agent. Even if you think you've done everything, you know, picture perfect. It, it's not, they're not interested. They already start with a presumption that you're bad. That's why they're auditing you, you know. And a lot of these auditors are not happy people, all right? So you get a letter. It says you're being audited, and it has a information request. And please get us these documents in, you know, 30 days, all right? So all of a sudden, you're panicked, right? I, I got to get this stuff together, and I need somebody to represent me. And I, it's not going to be my accountant because he didn't know what he was doing when he wrote the tax. He, he got me in this problem in the first place, right? So you got to find someone who knows crypto, who knows how to defend people. That's what we created a crypto tax audit for. So... What we do next is we uh, introduce ourselves to the rep to the auditor, so he knows immediately that he's not going to talk to the taxpayer. He's going to be talking to a third party. It takes the emotion out, and it forces him to be he can't play as many games. Secondly, uh, we packaged we get all, give him all the documentation he requests, and then I have a conversation with him, and I say, look, you know, we especially if he has a bulletproof tax return. We say, look, you know, we've got uh, disclosure statements here. We've done everything. This guy is above the board. You're wasting your time with this person. We want them to feel like they're wasting their time. And if he tries to push it, I'm going to drag him out and, and make it unfruitful for him. So uh, that's kind of what we, an audit is about. Now, okay, so an auditor, after this dialogue, might take a couple months. The auditor says, all right, I think I'm the auditor and I think you owe this money. Well, now what happens? Uh, we have a couple of lines of uh, action. We can either appeal to his manager. We can go, we can file a due process hearing. We can appeal any determinations that came out. There's a lot of different escalation points that are the laws or the regulations pr provide for us to do that. Uh, IRS won't really tell you that much about it, but we, we work that process in order to protect rights and to escalate it because an auditor just wants to uh, assess a big penalty and move on because that's how he gets measured, Right. You might need to speak to somebody more intelligent and more rational to actually get them to dress it. Hey, look, these crypto tr traders, or these auditors probably know less about crypto than anyone who's been watching your show for a month, all right? They know, you know, they, they, they don't know it. They just know their little thing. It's confusing to them. So the key is to be as thorough, be as polite and kind to them as possible and make them go away. That's the best strategy. So there's one thing that you mentioned in that uh, in that audit letter, which which I think is particularly interesting because a lot of people that are in crypto, you know, like especially like the old timers, they got into Bitcoin in 2011. Back then, people were buying pizzas on Bitcoin Talk for for 10,000 bitcoins and sending each other Bitcoin tipping. There have been a number of forks over the years, and it's like people, there are people out there and who have crypto that. They don't really know where they got it or when they got it or how they got it. It might be on, a, on an old hard drive. It's like finding old photos, right? You're like scrumming through your old hard drive and you find pictures of like when you were back in high school or something like that. And then, oh, you take that and you put it into your, into your sort of clean photo album. Well, not with crypto, because if you do that, then all of a sudden, you know, you need to start reporting that stuff. How should people kind of deal with this clutter? Well, first of all, when you're audited... You're audited on a specific year. In this guy's case, it's 2017. So uh, a lot of those types of transactions you refer to are probably, you know, before then. The, the auditor, he's been given the 2017 tax year to audit you. He's not interested in 16 or 18 unless he thinks he can, you know, increase his uh, quota attainment. So, you know, so he's not going to be looking there at those other years. Secondly, and I think this is really a, a couple words of assurance here. One, for all your tax, all taxpayers, a tax return is not like your high school math test where you have, there's a perfect answer and you're trying to get 100%. It's not like that at all. It's about getting close, all right? Because a lot of these things get to be debatable. How much was the gain on this, 
this coin? I don't know. I can't prove it. There's a lot of vagueness, right? You, we want to get to close. And that's, so I want to, because some people are just overly worried about those details, right? You're, they're worrying more than the auditor is going to worry. Uh, and I, I just want to give people that assurance. Uh, when they audit cryptos, it, it really, and I've studied this, they cannot really do a bottoms-up audit in the same way you as a taxpayer had to calculate your capital gains for all your trades. I mean, it's a nightmare. And, but they're not going to double-check that because they have no better records than you do. They have probably lesser tools than the ones you used online. So the way they audit is rather than coming, looking at starting from the bottom up, is more of what I call a top-down audit. They're going to look to see uh, if you reported enough income that they expected. So for example, this was a very, very real case. A guy called me and he had received a 1099 tax form, a 1099K from Bittrex for a million dollars. He said he was outraged. He was he was terrified. He said, "I never had more than twenty eight thousand dollars on Bitrix. How can they issue me a one million dollar, you know, ten ninety nine k?" And I said, "Well, hey, look here's here, and this will give us an idea how they audit. Imagine when you do a capital gains report, you list every transaction. You say, I, I on this date, I bought this coin for this amount." I sold it at this amount, and I had, this is my gain, all right? So I have what they call a cost and the proceeds. I said, look, so imagine this. So let's, and he was, he was a little bit of a high-frequency trader. So he, let's imagine this. He takes, takes $20,000. He puts it all on ETH. The next day, he sells it. It's gone up to $21,000, right? So he's got cost of $20,000, and he's got a proceeds of $21,000, a $1,000 gain. So he does this again the next day, 20,000 in, and the day after that, 21,000 out. So I got two transactions. What does that look like on his capital gains report? What are his total proceeds? Well, it's 21,000 plus 21,000, it's $42,000. He never had $42,000, right? Well, if we look at the fact, the cost column, that said 40, and the total gain was 2,000. Well, what, how do we correspond to this? Well, he was a high frequency trader. So those numbers just got really high, all right? Uh, I had one client, high frequency trader, four hundred and twenty million dollars in proceeds. All right, but that wasn't how much money he made. It's just the way it's counted. Now the IRS uses that number to see, like, they're going to expect they got a ten ninety nine k from Bitrix for a million dollars. They want to see at least, maybe more, but at least a million dollars showing up there on your capital gains report. It doesn't mean you had that as income. But that's the high-level check that they're looking for. If you report more than they know about from Bittrex, well, then the IRS is just happy, all right, that you're being honest. But we want to account for anything of a 1099K nature. So that's kind of how the IRS does that. So not to panic too much if you get a large 1099K. Okay, so they're using these 1099Ks as sort of an indicator to see which people potentially they could look into and, and to audit more thoroughly. Exactly. So what, what is the thing that you see in your practice where people are getting their returns totally wrong? Like, what is the most common uh, mistake that people make while filing their crypto return? The two biggest mistakes people make is one, they're not filing the anti-money laundering forms, the FBAR and 8938. These are massive. These are $10,000 penalties. The moment the IRS finds it and mails you a letter, that you didn't submit an FBAR, that's a $10,000 penalty right there and then. And then when you actually fill out and give it to them, they'll count the number of exchanges you reported, multiply it times 10,000, and they'll hit you with a penalty. All right, so five exchanges, 50,000 plus the original test, $60,000. And they can do this for multiple years. This is, this, is your mass, this is a massive financial exposure, and it's an easy to fix uh, situation. The second biggest mistake people made, particularly in 2017, was they thought they only had to report transactions on their tax return where they went to cash. So if they went from crypto to cash or fiat, then that they would report. They thought that if you went from crypto to crypto to crypto, that you didn't have to report those because you hadn't taken any gain out. Uh, there's a legal word for this. It's called like-kind exchange, tax code section 1031. But the biggest mistake they then made was Yes, you can do like-kind exchange up until the end of 2017 when the law changed. But the mistake they made was they didn't 
I, they didn't list all these trades on the tax return. In order to get like kind exchange, you have to list them. So they didn't list them. They're not entitled to them. So it's a massive exposure uh, for, for people. These are the two massive mistakes that people make. Yeah, especially the crypto to crypto exchanges, those are particularly hard to track because you know, if you used a service like Shapeshift before they introduced KYC and everything, there's no account, there's no email confirmation that's sent to you. So there's really not much of a way that people can actually trace these except for like doing a screenshot and keeping it in, in their files. Well, a screenshot's about all you can do. They're very dangerous, uh, those exchanges from a tax position because they leave you with very minimal documentation. It's uh, it's not in a structured format like a spreadsheet. You know, it, it's screenshots and you got to stick them somewhere, as you were describing before, clutter. I believe as people start to do their tax returns more and more, we're not going to put up with exchanges that do not provide good tools for pulling your transaction logs uh, and in the future, you know, generate accurate 1099 records. I think this is a something that we should put our foot down as traders, that we won't put up with stuff that gets us into trouble. So as a crypto holder who's concerned about maybe some unreported holdings or uh, unreported uh, exchange accounts or unreported gains, what are some proactive steps that these people can take to protect themselves against a potential audit and potential penalties in the future? The pain that taxpayers feel is like, I, I realized I didn't do it right 17 and 18. I didn't do my taxes right. And I now, this is the common sentiment that now they say, I, I want to do my 2019 taxes right because I think here in 2020, I'm going to make a fortune and I'll be able to pay off back taxes, but I don't want the IRS to come after my fortune because I screwed up in past years. Well, the good news is there's tax amnesty to fix the anti-money laundering forms that haven't been filed. Uh, I go back and I do the like-kind exchange analysis. And, and really, you, there's very few people in the country that do like-kind exchange analysis. Uh, and I will do it. And I save people fortunes. Last year, a guy came to me. He was a doctor. He made a lot of money. And a lot of it was withheld by his uh, practice. But he also invested. He had In 2017, he had gotten up to $2 million in crypto assets, crypto to crypto trading. He told his accountant in 2018, I need to report this. And the accountant goes, well, let's just file an extension. So September comes, October comes. The accountant hasn't filed his return. The accountant never filed the return because he was paralyzed on the cryptos. So uh, here then, you know, we talked to me last year. He goes, Clinton, I got, I got two problems. I got all this gain, plus I never filed my tax return. Now, hey, the IRS was pretty happy with him because they'd gotten like, They'd withheld like a couple, like a hundred thousand dollars already. So you know, they, they like that, All right? So I said, hey, "Look, here's what we did: we filed his tax return. We did like kind exchange on 2017. As, as a result, he had no taxes owed for his crypto trading. Uh, the like kind exchange, which was available through the end of 17, you know, passed on to 18, and then he had gains. But uh, at that point in time, he didn't have the penalties. He's able to get long term capital gains treatment on it. Saved him." We calculated roughly five hundred thousand dollars. I love that the accountants are also uh, are also scared. <laughs> <laughs> hey, actually, uh, I've really become much more aware of this from clients calling me up. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning in Schedule One uh, of income. Now you have to answer this question: Did you have any dealings with virtual currency? Right. Well, all account all tax preparers have to ask that question now uh, because it's in the form. They have to answer it yes or no. All right. But, they're, but then guys are telling me that the account, well, very few accountants, in my opinion, really understand what to do with cryptocurrencies, which is, you know, I have an opinion about that. But what people, people are now telling me is that their accountants have a statement in there that says they're not responsible for any reporting related to their cryptocurrencies. So how would you like to have your tax return done by a guy who's not taking responsibility for doing it right? You know, how much did you pay for that return? So how can you help our listeners uh, who are in the U.S. or even, you know, I, I think like a lot of our listeners are also expats and live abroad, but still have to file taxes in the U.S. What do you offer them? We have a lot of experience with expats uh, and a lot of expat traders. My company, we, we do a lot of tax returns. We do the bulletproof tax returns that I described. But in order to help the most amount of people, we've 
uh, are now offering a service called Crypto Tax Audit uh, at CryptoTaxAudit.com. And for a low annual subscription rate, you get audit protection on any return that the IRS would come after you for, and particularly if it's related to cryptos. Now, we could, no matter what they're coming after you, we can help you with it. Uh, but if you, if it's crypto related, then our IRS representation services and tax research are done for free. If it's a, if it's directly a crypto related uh, problem, and we can do that because we're going to be, we're handling lots of them. We understand how they're coming after it. We know how to come answer those audit letters and how to deal consistently with these uh, auditors. But uh, you know, when you do a tax return, there's a lot of other work that's done besides talking to the IRS. You have to, you know gather up lots of documentation and you know synthesize it into something meaningful that's other work that has to be done so also in the crypto tax subscribers to crypto tax audit get access to some uh, first of all you get a free copy of our uh, crypto health check book which is a helps you look at your past tax returns to see you know how good are they? You know, what do you, you know, have you done the things you need to do? It's a magnificent tool. It's about 38 pages long. It's chock full of good stuff. Secondly, uh, we have a couple video mini courses. One is on how to prepare the FBAR and Form 8938. Uh, these are the anti money laundering forms. I did this because accountants do not know how to complete these. Software like TurboTax and Tax Act will not even file the FBAR form. And most accounting software, uh, for ta uh, professional grade tax software, will not do the FBAR form for you. So, you know, in order to in empower my uh, subscribers, I've given them a video. They can learn how to do it and how to subscribe it themselves. So they'd be educated. And then we also have another video, how to use TurboTax to file a crypto tax return. TurboTax does not support, really, uh, a true crypto tax return. So I show you how to basically go off-roading with TurboTax, how to jam in some extra forms so you can create, you can put a Kevlar vest on your tax return and, uh, you know, feel better at night. I want to do things that are affordable for people because not everybody can afford to have a, a firm amend your returns for you. But if you have some help, you can do it yourself. So that's the biggest help I do. And if somebody really has a complex problem, uh, they can reach me on the Crypto Tax Audit webpage. You can schedule a consultation and we can talk and fix your returns. So how much does this cost? $97. For a year. So for $97 a year, you get this ebook, you get the videos, you get the how to complete your TurboTax uh, crypto return, but you also get, you described it earlier as sort of an insurance policy. It's an insurance policy for the IRS representation. Now, there's other things in, a, in responding to a tax return that are not IRS representation. You got to, you know, put together the documents and all that sort of stuff. That's, there's a fee for that. Uh, the... Video mini courses have a very nominal fee for them as well, and you know, not to surprise anyone. But you know, we we charge for that, so we can try to keep the quality up uh, and keep it out there. I'm looking at putting more things out there. So yeah, it's a tremendous value. I think for the vast majority of traders, this is what you know. Plus, you're getting you're getting hooked into the A team. The moment you get an IRS letter, you already know who you're going to call. You're you know, you'll be calling my staff. Me, we'll be going right to work to get you the best defense. To keep, you know, the IRS, I got a quote here for you by a U.S. Senator Henry Belmont. He says, in a recent conversation with an official of the IRS, I was amazed when they told me if taxpayers in this country ever discovered that the IRS operates on 90% bluff, the entire system would collapse. So that bluffing is in full it begins when they start sending you this uh, audit letter. There's, it's all about scare. It's all about fear. So, you know, that's why I want to protect people, defend people, show them how to defend, you know, do it, a good tax return, and then represent people who do get uh, selected. Okay, I just, I just want to drive this point home here. So, what, what people get when they when they sign up for this uh, this defense annual subscription is that they get the peace of mind. So if ever they get one of these forms, if ever they get audited. You'll have their back, essentially, and you'll be representing them with the IRS, and you'll be uh, calling those bluffs, basically, uh, and, and helping them make the best of the situation and helping them file uh, all of these uh, disclosure forms and putting together this bulletproof tax return, as you mentioned. Exactly. 
That's that sounds great. I mean, that seems like a great value. It's fantastic, and there's nobody else doing anything like this. Accountants aren't doing it. TurboTax, Tax Act are not providing. They don't support crypto traders. They don't offer anything like that. You're on your own. But we give you the tools as part of the service because the best time to fix a problem with your tax return is before you get the letter. So that's why we put those uh, tools out there to show you how to do that. Great. So please remind people uh, where they can find you and uh, how to get more information about this. CryptoTaxAudit.com. Uh, you can go there to subscribe. If you have an immediate uh, need, you can also, there's a page for non-subscribers to contact our offices and have a half-hour consultation. Clinton, thanks so much for being on and uh, helping provide this great resource to our listeners. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you, Sebastian.